Well, it's been 10 years since China raised the concept of building a community with a shared future for mankind. And this idea aims to answer the most fundamental question between conflicts and peace, division and unity, chaos and order. Where should we be heading? That's right. The challenge the world is facing today shows that building a community with a shared future for mankind is more than a political solution proposed by China. It's a vision and a wisdom the country offers in a time when only joint efforts can make real differences. And this is CGTN's special forum, Our World. And today we're talking about how this concept was created, how it's developed, and its significance in addressing global crisis. I'm Yang Zhao. And I'm Li Dongning. And for our discussion today, we're now very pleasured to be joined in the studio by Mr. Xia Lu, an associate professor from the School of Marxism Studies at Renmin University of China. And Mr. Liu Baocheng, the Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics. And Mr. David Ferguson, a senior translation editor from Foreign Language Press of China International Publishing Group. And Mr. Aina Tangen, uh, the independent political and economic commentator. Thank you very much, you. gentlemen, for joining us in the studio today. And also joining us online, our former Ethiopian ambassador to China, Tashome Toga Chanaka, Professor Jia Daojun from the School of International Studies at uh, Peking University, and Joseph Oliver Mendol, the, uh, the African Youth Delegation in China. Welcome to our world. Well, building a community with shared future for mankind actually is China's uh, worldview mm -hmm. and has been written into UN resolutions. But despite this idea of China working with the rest of the world to achieve something better, the West still firmly believes China is a threat. Mm -hmm. It is a threat that would challenge the international current order and imposing threats to other nations. So, Professor Xiao, I will start with you on this matter. What is the logic and the value behind the idea of China threat? Thanks very much for the question. Actually, uh, this is very important. And we have recently done a project, a research project, on um, how does the Western people view China, or how has the Chinese image changed through all this kind of reform period. Uh, we have noticed that in the uh, early stage of China's reform in the 1980s, actually, uh, it was not a China threat thesis yet. It was chi kind of a, a skepticism of China, because all the Western kind of powers and the countries and even the companies, uh, they were skeptical of China about whether China can you know, successfully you know, do the reform or kind of a, a boom the economy. So the first stage is China skeptical or skeptical of China. And the second stage actually in 1990s, it was not yet the threat, but, uh, but, but it's the China kind of collapse. The collapse of China, because you know, follow the 1980s and 1990s, in all the the, the old foreign uh, kind of, I mean, the communist regime kind of uh, uh, broken down. So they would argue that you know, for the near future, China will follow this path. However, well, China didn't collapse, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was the thesis about China's threat, because mm -hmm. nowadays we we have been noticed that China is getting stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So um, China becomes a threat in these three reasons. First one, China is very kind of a, a huge country with a population of more than 1.4 billion. Mm -hmm. So never happened before 1.4 billion people got rising up or got kind of prosperity and got kind of uh, um, stronger and stronger so that's the first reason second reason that china is a very kind of a big country uh, that uh, in, 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 and more than kind of uh, um, 56 uh, minor a uh, minor ethnic group so um, it is a kind of uh, image that china will become stronger and become you know getting expanding for its influence outside china's kind of uh, 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 traditional kind of influence of the fear so that's the second reason the third reason is that uh, for example, if you were standing uh, 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 on the near side of the road, if there is a very huge car driving by with a kind of a high speed, you will feel threatened by nature or by kind of the you know emotion. So that's a natural uh, that, that's a kind of a natural sense of the of the feeling China as a threat. But what we need to do is to try to explain to the outside world that China is getting stronger, stronger will not expand, will not kind of become a he hegemonial or, or hegemony like this kind of thing. So this is uh, uh, the logic and the value of the. China threat. Uh, but I would like to say that the thesis of the China threat will exist for a longer period because China is getting stronger and stronger. As long as China is getting stronger and stronger, and this kind of thesis will exist. But we need to do some kind of job to explain to the outside world that China is not a threat. It will be safe if everyone is in the car, right? Yes, yes. So yes. the speed won't matter. Yes. So, Aina, help us understand more of what Professor Xia said that uh, in, Western, in, in the West eyes, that China at first they would question, can you do it? And then you're collapsing. 
and now you're a threat. What's the logic behind that? Well, it's, it's very simple. I, I see it from an American point of view looking in, and that is, quite frankly, China's political and economic system is an existential threat uh, to the United States' idea uh, that it has the perfect system. If you go back to Francis Fukuyama, you know, we all know him. He's been backing away from this idea that the end of the world and the last man standing, this idea that uh, liberal democratic capitalism is the be all. There is no way to go forward. That's the end of you know, mankind in terms of evolution in this area. Well, you know, if, if you're an American exceptionalist, somebody who believes that the U.S. needs to be in charge of the world in order to prevent World War III, in order to safeguard uh, the international uh, order, the rule of law, all of these things, China's success doesn't work for you. Why? Because it has a different system. Now, it could work if we could just simply say there are many paths that can lead to prosperity mm -hmm. and that different cultures, different systems will invariably mm -hmm. have different answers and, and ways of addressing them, mm -hmm. but we don't. So we continue down this thing that, you know, originally it was, well, we'll get China to join the WTO, right, remember? And that was going to, if China embraces capitalism, democracy will come. Mm -hmm. In essence, it was the dream of regime change in China. Mm -hmm. They literally thought the government would collapse from within because people would, you know, love capitalism. Mm -hmm. But China thrived. It used capitalism as a mechanism mm -hmm. to, extend its socialist values. But is it all about ideological uh, matter, ideological threat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean underneath it, I mean, you, you have those who consciously push this idea, uh, the, the war machine, the military industrial complex, it's just us or them. They have a team mentality. We have to win. We need everything that, you know, we need all the tools necessary to do it. Give us more money. Mm -hmm. But subconsciously in America, there is this belief that we're number one. How many times have you gone anywhere and they say, we're number one, right? Uh, you know, America first. Mm. You know, it, that was a slogan that came in afterwards, but it, it was very much a reaction. You know, China is saying the world is for everybody. That's right. Not America is first. Mm. So let us say that these visions are somewhat apart. Now, for China, it's purely mathematics. Mm. You cannot... You know, everyone in the world can't be the U.S. because you have less than 5% of the population okay. consuming more than 20% of the world's GDP. Mm. You know, you, you just do the simple math. It just doesn't work. And even if China was to achieve that, there would be nothing left for the rest of the world. Okay. okay. David, sorry. Yeah. David, uh, Yeah, the question you asked was, um, we know what needs to be done and why it's not happening. Um, and I think the biggest single obstacle what the world faces at the moment in terms of building the global community we need is U.S. hegemony. Mm. If you think about it in historical terms, I mean, I made the point about the U.S. being number one. In historical terms, the U.S. hasn't been number one for a very long time. But in human terms, there's next to nobody alive today who can remember a time when the U.S. was not number one. And the U.S. has a very deep need to hang on to that number one spot. The U.S. is like an athlete, a runner, who's never lost a race. And they're obsessed with their status mm -hmm. as always being the winner. Mm -hmm. And they now face a situation where it is certain mm -hmm. that somebody else is going to overtake them. Mm -hmm. And they need to learn. It's having a visceral effect on that country and they need to learn to cope with the idea that they do not have to be number one at everything all the time because if they don't do that we're not going to make progress we're not going to move forward the things that we know need to happen are not going to be allowed to happen you should ask americans if they agree with that <laughs> that's well, american no. egoism no, I, I do. I mean, well no it's to take your point arrogance is the downfall of empires and, and quite frankly, every, I agree with everything you just said. Uh, the, the problem is that what is happening in America is infectious. The poor leadership that leads to scapegoating, to looking to some other, but somebody else is at fault. It couldn't be us. You know, why should we reflect? It's not our fault. It's somebody else's fault. That has led uh, in a chain reaction to poor leadership around the world. So it does matter. When you are a power, 
right? You have a responsibility. I mean, I, I'm so tired of people telling me about their rights. Where are the responsibilities? You cannot have one without the other. The U.S. has no right to rule the world, but as the number one power, it has a responsibility to do it well. And we're not, okay? We have, if you look up the definition of a rogue nation, uh, we, we often label others as rogue. What do they do? Well, they start wars. Uh, they undermine the international uh, you know, institutions, right? They disregard the rights of others, right? They impose their will on others. This, in a nutshell, is the United States. We've been involved in 81% of all the conflicts since World War II. Well, you, you can say, oh, we're, we're, we're fighting the good fight, but it's not. Nothing has improved. We are less safe today than we were after World War II, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there needs to be self-reflection mm. in the United States before anything can happen. Because if the U.S. does not want to play, I do not know how you can bring the world together. Well, exactly. In China, there's a, it's a quite long history and philosophy about to call the people from with different background and culture background, living experiences, they, they united together. There's mm. been a long history for that mm. and for this kind of inclusiveness. So, uh, Mr. Chad, I want to, maybe we, we can discuss that from the perspective of history and maybe we can start it from the perspective of modern um, international relationships about how does China ensure this kind of inclusiveness and ability to coexist with other cultures? Well, actually, uh, before we enter this question, mm -hmm. I would like to clarify two um, very similar, but uh, kind of a two, you know, difficult uh, 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 concept with difficult to understanding. That is the uh, civilization and the culture. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, actually, well, different scholars will have different agreement on That's this right. concept uh, of the civilization and culture. In my opinion, a culture is more of a, you know, uh, uh, it's more of a, let's say, um, a, 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 a product and uh, this kind of um, uh, a real thing. But civilization is more broad, and civilization is more generous. Civilization can exist. We can have only one civilization, like a human civilization, the Earth civilization, the solar system civilization. However, within this kind of Earth civilization, we can have a different culture. For example, the Asian culture, you know, the European culture, even African culture. So, in terms of this, actually, in ancient China, in ancient China, the you know the emergence of Chinese civilization was starting was kind of starting to incorporate the different cultures when you know, uh, uh, it, the ancient China faced all these kinds of different cultures. For example, we know that the grape was not grown in China. Grape kind of imported from the, you know, um, uh, the Central Asia, right? And also the green, nowadays we eat the green. The green does not exist in China for a longer period. And also we know some kind of instrument, the, the kind of erhu, the instrument, and treating Chinese music. And all these kind of, even the clothing style, they were coming from the Central Asia and even different uh, culture, different kind of, uh, uh, yes, cultural background. So we can see that the entire, you know, uh, Chinese civilization history is the absorption and adaption to different cultures into one single or one one general or one integrated civilization. So this is how China can, um, you know, show to the outside world that it still has the, you know, level of uh, inclusiveness and level of ability to coexist with other cultures, even to generate one single civilization. Professor Zhao, are you as optimistic to think that uh, Chinese and the Western culture and values can communicate? Yes and no. Let me say the no first. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem that there that echo chamber both here in China and in some countries as you call the West, although that very notion is uh, contested in an academic sense, uh, partly due to the pandemic, partly due to, you know, the distance of travel or the realities of time zone differences, the actual level of interactions uh, at the societal level has been traditionally thin between China and those countries we generally call the West. And over the years, the power of prevailing narratives mm. or simplifying narratives mm. is strong. So we have to be aware of that. It's quite risky, actually. Mm. Now, can we get along? I assume that there is the yes side. The yes side is that, although earlier our discussions uh, commentators mentioned the realization or self-recognition of the notion of um, exceptionalism. Mind you, there is 
a good deal of that in every society and every culture. And that very realization um, is uh, opens the window to, let's say, self-learning, um, self-reflection. And that self-reflection can lead to, if not change, a moderations of what we usually call harsh views or attitudes. Uh, in the totality, I wouldn't view the rhetoric that paints China as a threat that alarmingly, I, I would treat this as an invitation to greater efforts to uh, communicate and to understand, appraise, and appreciate, and most importantly, to self-reflect. Mm. That holds true for China. It also holds true for those who may be uh, waving their fingers mm. against well, however, whatever they define to be mm. China. There have been a lot, a great deal of efforts in achieving that, in, in achieving inclusiveness, in achieving unity. Olympics, for one, is right. a, it's very, a good example. It's a good example, a great effort mm -hmm. in doing that. And uh, I was uh, at the closing ceremony of the 2022 yeah, Beijing you're, Olympics you're, you're and Paralympic Games. You're an announcer. I was the on site announcer. And that's why, David, your tie seems very familiar, familiar to me. Yes, I'm wearing with great pride my Winter Olympics tie. I was actually invited to the opening ceremony, mm. but I also spoke on a couple of occasions to the staff uh, mm. organising About what? the... Well, I spoke to them about international communication, mm. and I was rewarded with a tie in exchange. Right, talking about international communication, actually we noticed uh, one more word was uh, added to the original uh, motto, stronger, mm -hmm. faster and higher. That's right together it's a new one yeah. it's a new one it's an involvement what do you think is the purpose of adding that one more word together well interestingly enough there's also the slogan mm. um building a better future together right and i actually participated in the discussion which led to that slogan being selected mm. there were a number of options some English, some Chinglish, mm. but I actually helped to, to devise the slogan. Mm. But what you were saying about young people, I think is really, really important in terms of the concept of a global, a global community, mm. because young people are the future, and young people are a very important demographic. And one of the things that China has to learn to do is to engage with people on a human level, and they should specifically target young people because apart from anything else, young people have not spent many years hearing negative stories about China. Mm. So they're more likely to be open and they're more likely to be positive. Now, what are young people interested in? They're interested in music, they're interested in fashion, and they're interested in cool sports like snowboarding. Mm. And what does China have now? They have a group of people successful young people like Sui Ming and Guai Ling in a field that young people around the world are interested in. So I think that is a key area that sport and events like the Winter Olympics is a key area where they can play a part in communicating positive messages about China to receptive audiences. Mm -hmm. Now I would want to turn to our online guest uh, Toshome uh, we're talking about as uh, the Olympic Committee has been putting together into the moda. Uh, how do you see this kind of evolution of changes? Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me on the show and uh, the views I express are uh, mine. I think the concept of uh, building uh, a community with shared future together is a very important concept uh, because no one country, big or small, China or USA can shoulder the current challenge uh, humanity is facing. Uh, that's why I think building a shared, building a community with a shared future together is important. I want uh, everyone to look at the concept, the merit of the concept and the content of the concept rather than uh, the messenger. I think we should look at the message because in the last 10 years, we have faced so many challenges. And I believe that we are living in a very volatile, complex, and uh, unstable world. And what we need to do together is to really have an inclusive process where we can uh, address all these challenges. Uh, 
And that can only come if you have, uh, I think, unity uh, of purpose. That can only be a reality if we work together. Uh, of course, it is not uh, uh, easy. Uh, it is easier than, than done, but we have no other choice, I believe, because uh, the current type of the problem we are facing, including the pandemic uh, we went through, uh, required global cooperation. And the global community cannot be built only through competition. I believe that there should be competition, but at the same time, there should be cooperation and solidarity. And the concept of, I think, building a future community with shared future clearly signifies the importance of solidarity and cooperation. Mm -hmm. That's how look, I look at it. That's right. So, uh, Joseph, are you with us? So what would be yes. the consequences if nations or people of different communities are cutting apart rather than getting together? What is your point? Um, well, uh, from the from the youth perspective, I think uh, it's very problematic because uh, when we look at the biggest the biggest picture, uh, we see that uh, now people are more connected. From the young perspective, uh, working together is actually uh, the future. Is actually uh, everything for us. Uh, you mentioned a variety of to uh, of topic a while ago, uh, like uh, going to. The, um, the Winter Olympic and everything, all that were good news for us because we've been actually, um, you know, restrained for two to three years. So communication among people, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm referring to down to earth communication, you know, have been actually restrained ever since the, the pandemic broke out. So uh, to resort to conflict or to resort to any kind of uh, conflict of any sort is actually very problematic and especially for uh, me coming from Africa, where the, pop the, where the population is extremely young. Uh, so I think uh, throughout, just to just uh, link up uh, with, uh, you know, the, the, main, the main topic, which is com uh, the community, building up the community with a shared future. Uh, throughout my experience here in China, uh, I actually learned that since ancient time uh, that uh, some, some have mentioned, like uh, Chinese always held a say going all people uh, you know, under the heaven, uh, one family, and all the people are brothers, and we share the life of all creator, uh, creatures. And this actually resonates with uh, the African percep perception of, you know, community and life. We call that in Africa, Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, we are very uh, actually inclined, the young population, when I say we, I say the youth, uh, is very inclined for partnership, cooperation, rather mm -hmm. than conflict. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, the, such kind of education, especially into the younger group, the young people, is very important. Talking about the future, I'm very much into the sci-fi works recently, a big fan of Liu Signori knew that. And the, uh, the hit movie, the recently very hit movie, The Wandering Earth 2. By the way, who saw that? Raise your hand, please. Yeah. Professor Xia <laughs> no? saw that. For those who didn't see it, don't worry, no worries. We're going to give you some rough ideas of what the movie is about. Lieutenant Colonel Liu Peiqiang, please head to the hibernation chamber immediately. Most, human can live. 2044, the space elevator crisis. Oh my god. 2058, lunar fall crisis. 2075, the Jupiter gravitational pull crisis. 2078, the solar helium flash crisis. In order to survive, great efforts and sacrifices were made by men. Men are in awe of the history, yet despise the future. The fate of civilization is up to the choices of men. The biggest impediment for survival is never weakness. But arrogance. Okay, so Professor Xia, you raised your hand just yeah, now, yeah. meaning you've seen it, but I need to verify that. So a little quiz for you. What's yeah. the name of that AI robot, robot the that name uh, is, interviewed Liu Peiqiang? The name is Moss. The name why is Moss? Moss? Because it's a kind of a, uh, the word upside down, because it's a ty uh, it's a, it's type is 550W, uh, so uh, the word upside down is Moss. So that's okay. the name of the AI. So you already see that. Yeah. Great, great, great. <laughs> so what impressed you the most 
when you're watching a film about human beings facing the extreme kind of dis disaster together? Well, actually, uh, like, like you, I, I, I'm also a very kind of big fan of the sci-fi. And I have read all the works written by Mr. Liu Cixin from the Three Body Problem mm -hmm. and also this kind of uh, Wandering Earth. Mm -hmm. And I have watched this, uh, uh, the, the first episode of Wandering Earth three or four years ago. And then uh, when this uh, second kind of episode came out, I just uh, went to the cinema for the first time. I mean, uh, the first time it came out. And I, I, uh, the, the most impressed kind of plot to me is that, uh, well, human society Actually, by nature, it, uh, it, it, it by nature, human society cannot join together, and they, they, they always want their kind of their own interest, their own kind of solution. For example, a certain country in the movie, they wanted to develop their own kind of uh, technology mm -hmm. to pursue their own interest. However, facing the common, the general crisis to the human civilization, I mean, the crisis to the civilization, to the earth, well, that kind of crisis, you know, push the human society, the community for the share in the future, join together. Mm -hmm. So just back to the previous kind of question, mm -hmm. well, um, what is the consequence of people do not join together? Right. What, is the, what is the kind of consequence of people setting apart? You know, in my opinion, uh, cutting apart is the natural sense, it's a natural situation. However, joining together is more difficult than you know, remain this, you know, the current situation. That is why we need is to do something. Is it possible that joining together will create more conflict? Well, um, that's a very interesting question. You know, joining together will definitely create some kind of a disagreement, but that disagreement not necessarily, you know, develop into conflict because right. people have a wi have the wisdom to solve the mm. agreement. Because and that's not the aim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the, you know, uh, impressive kind of plot in the movie is that uh, the, a China diplomat standing in the United Nations and the mm. platform and uh, made a speech to all the people, to all the human civilization, saying mm. that, uh, you know, in ancient time, an, an ancient kind of the prehistory people, you know, he got broken in his leg and all his kind of, uh, you know, not necessary neighbors, but also their kind of, not necessary friend, but also neighbors, you know, just came to help him uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, got, got his leg killed. Uh, why, why cannot we in the modern time, you know, in the, in the 21st century people join together to solve our, our kind of crisis? So that's kind of touched me a lot. And you know what, Donan, the crisis doesn't exist only in sci-fi movies. Mm. Because over the past decades, particularly the past few years, we've seen a number of global crises, and many, many of the which have required the joint efforts of many countries. The world is still battling multiple crises that threaten peace and stability. According to the World Food Program, around 345 million people will not have enough food in 2023. More than 900,000 people are fighting to survive in famine conditions. The organization says 70% of those affected are living in conflict zones like Yemen, Ukraine and the Tigray region. The conflicts also fuel inflation and skyrocketing energy prices. The International Energy Agency in 2022 warned that over 75 million people worldwide will not be able to afford electricity as central banks hike interest rates in response to inflation, the World Bank warns the world may be edging toward a global recession in 2023. It has slashed the global economic growth outlook to 1.7% this year, down from 3%. It has also predicted the global core inflation rate to stand at about 5% this year, nearly double the five-year average before the pandemic. Meanwhile, critical public health emergencies are also dominating headlines. As of March, more than 6 million people have lost their lives. Other major public health issues, such as Ebola and monkeypox, continue to raise international concerns. And now we turn, it, uh, turn to uh, Professor Jia. So why are we seeing such global crisis now? And do you think the, the conflicts are intensifying during the past decade? The conflicts are not really bad. It's a how you re you meaning any actor react to a uh, conflict but uh, uh, your question has a serious dimension to that that is to say for a while especially with uh, quote unquote lessons of forever wars uh, the u.s was involved in in afghanistan and in iraq and wherever else now for a while, a couple of years, you know, there was a sense of relief, both uh, in NATO countries and outside NATO, saying, oh, well, 
military does not solutions does not have to be the ultimate. But unfortunately, I'm not saying uh, I'm not attributing any kind of causal relationship. The military means have now turned to be seems to be a renewed option. If you look at one government after another massively uh, increasing their military budgets. Uh, let's face it, this money can be spent. You know, there is a choice of how you spend the money. Uh, but the human, <clears throat> when you produce bullets, uh, bullets don't go away as chocolate bars go. So it's more concerning. Now, I would think uh, the there can be zillions of uh, interpretations or analysis, point of analysis that say uh, that try to make sense of the growing trend towards once again choosing war as a means of resolving conflicts. But then collectively, I mean, for the uh, countries, especially in this uh, outside of NATO, we need to be uh, saying more loudly, telling them, look, have you really exhausted all means of conflict resolution? And that's, you know, we shouldn't be hijacked uh, by that sentiment saying the West, the uh, so-called West, they were, uh, uh, my English always bad. If you recall, a couple of years back at uh, the Munich Security Conference, you know, the Munich Security Conference is not just a conference. It's a place that shapes the uh, agenda of military policies, uh, mainly NATO countries. One justification for that was the so-called Westlessness. Mm -hmm. In other words, somehow the West was absent in managing affairs worldwide. Now, outside NATO, outside you know the countries that the uh, NATO uh, the workshops like the Munich Security Conference, we should be. I would go even further, say educating those who believe somehow that. West forwardness would mean happiness for all. We have to be careful here. Uh, there is, I, I hope this is not going to be uh, viewed by our audiences as a, sh should we say, a thrust of a challenge or a confrontation. But, uh, you know, uh, I do believe there is space for more open mindedness, mindedness, both in the so called West and outside, and more particularly NATO. And Toshome, uh, what is your take on those uh, global crises in the, in, the, in, the, in the recent decade? If you take uh, the relationship between China uh, and uh, Africa, uh, for instance, the Chinese uh, uh, government and the Chinese people have chosen their own governance model, their own development model. It worked for them. and. Uh, China now has become one of the major uh, global powers, economically, technologically, militarily. But uh, one thing that created a conducive uh, space for us to work with China is China, China has never imposed uh, any of its will, any of uh, its policies uh, on Africa. I think that is how we should uh, go about. Uh, otherwise, imposition and then uh, putting pressure on countries to choose uh, the values uh, of uh, other societies has created and complicated the problem for uh, uh, global uh, governance coming together. Now, in terms of the way uh, forward, again, I still believe that uh, we need to put the multilateral yeah. system uh, into effectiveness. Uh, we need to strengthen the system. We all need to work together so that uh, the process should be inclusive. Uh, we had just uh, the AU summit uh, here in Addis Ababa, and uh, one call that all leaders have made that uh, Africa should have uh, a place at UN Permanent Security Council uh, because a continent with 54, uh, 55, 54 member states, a continent with 1.3 uh, billion people, and a continent whose agenda has always been tabled. Most of the th table at UN Security Council does not have representatives. How can we really work together as humanity so that we can all participate, we can all contribute? Now, uh, 
the Chinese wisdom, again, uh, is extremely important. The last four years, uh, what uh, I observed when I was Ethiopia's ambassador to China is that China is willing to share whatever it has, whether it is a development model, uh, whether it is technology transfer, whether it is uh, other uh, Chinese experience on the wheel of the receiving countries, on the wheel of the continent of uh, Africa, where we work as uh, uh, partners. This is very critical, and I think we have to have an open line of dialogue. We have differences. There is no question about that. And we are not envisaging a world without difference. But how do we manage our differences? Through respect to one another, through dialogue, through communication. Avoid and stop imposition or of your own wish on uh, others. I think those are very fundamental principles that uh, we can uh, live uh, as humanity. And then certainly we have uh, a future to share, uh, not only for us, but for our uh, uh, children, for our, the coming generation. And we have a responsibility to work together. Right. And uh, Professor Jaja said uh, the conflicts are not necessarily completely negative. And I think crisis are not necessarily completely negative either, because especially Chinese believe there are always opportunities in crisis. That's why we always say Wei Ji, right. opportunities in crisis. But the, one of the gigantic common crises we are facing right now, Professor Liu, is uh, the climate change issue, the climate issues. And uh, that's actually an opportunity at the same time that can bring all countries sitting down at the same table to talk about it, right? Peacefully, maybe, maybe not very peacefully, because there are gigantic differences on this matter as well. So are you optimistic to see that problem being solved? Well, as a researcher in philosophy and ethics, I would say, <laughs> okay, uh, you know, human beings are really the young species on this uh, very small planet. Yes. And uh, they are born as community animals, so therefore they need to hop together and work hand in hand. And in the same time, they need to, uh, uh, to learn faster, to be more creative in order to survive, because individually they are more vulnerable than monkeys, than polar bears. And so uh, that really uh, set the notion of tog togetherness, you know, as we have uh, uh, discussed. But in the meantime, human beings are more greedy than any other animals because they all always wanted to uh, possess more. But uh, you know, that's really the motive uh, you know, to move forward the civilization if- Some the, would say it's for human beings survival. How would you answer that? You know, if we are able to, uh, to uh, have a rule-based uh, framework so that uh, you know, nobody is there to predate on the other's interest in, uh, in terms of the territory, in terms of the material wealth, and also human dignity. And uh, now, you know, you, you talk about the, uh, you know, the uh, crisis, and I, I would say that uh, the biggest crisis is not really climate change, is not really about the pandemic, but also the human greed that is unchecked. And that is the permanent uh, hideous disease that the human beings really need to carry. So to solve the problem, um, we are able to uh, to make sure that people are able to compete because you know people wanted to stand out and to possess more on a fair basis. But on the other hand, we also need to uh, uh, to cultivate the people's conscience through self-discipline. And for that, the Xi Jinping's concept of a shared uh, uh, future is there, you know, derived from the long uh, historical uh, philosophy and also ethical values that are there working for China and hopefully it's gonna be working for the entire mankind because you know, the, this concept begins with individual conscience uh, cultivation mm -hmm. and also with family discipline and then with state governance and with world pacification. Right. And that really allows a inclusivity in which university values are there to be applied for all human beings with respect, and also particular attention needs to be paid to differences of uh, uh, the social, political, and the cultural uh, you know, uh, backgrounds. So that's something that, uh, that can be promoted. But the issue is that uh, this concept is uh, really there to be uh, you know, highly uh, valuable but we need to strategize it into a more of the uh, you know, 
global lexicon uh, in which that uh, uh, people from different cultural, different social background can really interpret it in the right mm -hmm. direction instead mm -hmm. of it being misused mm -hmm. and abused. Mm. Right, you raised a very big, very philosophical question, how to contain human greed. Human greed actually in, in one aspect can promote the development of the human race, but on the other hand, it needs to be contained. And yes, especially I think civilization really, really you know, moved forward by people standing on the shoulder of the other with vision and wisdom, but not really standing on the bodies of the other right. uh, you know, right. to be able to move. We are not only standing on the bodies of other races, but are on our, on our own race as well. Exactly. That's something that we need to contain, as well as relentless actions of uh, emitting carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And some people have been making great efforts in registering very accurate uh, carbon footprints. I know you made a fantastic documentary about that. Do you know that every day, our species consumes more than 1.5 million terajoules of energy. 84% of those energy comes from fossil fuels. Presently, we are emitting about 40 gigatons per year of CO2. And you know the rest of the story. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Oh my. my colleagues and I embark a global journey. It's failed. <laughs> it's almost like launching a rocket. Solar panels could be found anywhere in China. To find solutions to erase the carbon footprint of humans from this planet. They could be large or small. <laughs> From that. Concrete or virtual. Some old fashioned ones. It's like science fiction. With a bit of imagination. And the ends of the earth were just under your feet. We must reduce carbon emission on the one hand and remove those in the atmosphere on the other complementary efforts to help us reach net zero emissions. You ready? That's right, it's, uh, it's called Human Carbon Footprint. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I didn't expect that I will be uh, the guest today. I thought I'm, not, I'm the host. So uh -huh. thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> Well, that's You're a very, welcome. Well, that's a, that's a phenomenal um, journey to uh, make the films like that, because this film is talking about is the, a very buzzword last year about carbon neutrality. It was the big words, popular, so popular that everybody was talking about it. If you ask persons on the street, have you ever heard of carbon neutrality? Well, in Chinese, it's have you ever heard about that? Mm. The people would say, well, yeah, we heard about this. And with Every specific numbers as well. That's right, but everybody, but people have been confused about this term uh, because when we're talking about carbon neutrality, we're talking about net zero emissions, but many people thought, okay, that means a zero emission. That would confuse these right. two terms of people about, well, maybe we should get rid of the fossil fuels completely and uh, emitted nothing at all, but in the near future, it's impossible. Maybe in the future, it will become possible when we successfully control the fusion, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about that later. But in the near future, uh, we still need to use the fossil fuels. But a question would become how we can reduce the use of this carbon emission. In the international community, we've been talking too much about this funding and techno technology right. transfer because we have to rely on science and in innovation. Mm. So I got this a question for uh, Mr. Ja. Uh, so what is your take on how we, how we can reach the carbon neutrality? And uh, we've been talking too much about funding issues and tech technology transfer issues on the international community. But why this becomes the biggest obstacles? Um, on the way to deal with the climate change crisis. Climate change uh, has many dimensions to that. What you have just mentioned uh, summarizes more of uh, the recognitions by scientists and uh, those who campaign on behalf of protecting the global environment. 
but in the context of uh, the CO2, uh, I'm sorry, COP27 that uh, was conducted in Egypt uh, November last year, the issue of funding became uh, more formal. Well, the, that issue of funding has been there for a while. Now, many uh, in the quote-unquote global south, meaning more developing countries, are now uh, seeing greater light that they would get funding support to address climate change uh, challenges in their own societies. That may not be coming that easily because that funding may uh, ref come through the uh, channel of development aid, and with aid, you always have uh, many of the projects will be tied to interests and the conditions that are set by uh, what we may call the global north. So uh, at the end of the day, there is indeed an issue that's sometimes not addressed. That would be what's called the carbon uh, climate justice. In other words, uh, countries, especially those in the low and middle income sectors, uh, the low and middle echelons of global development, they uh, can and they have the right to demand more uh, climate justice uh, treatment. But on the other hand, they, they don't really have a shortcut. Uh, there, are, uh, there are opportunities here, and that opportunities, how, to, how those opportunities uh, should be marketized. In other words, how those opportunities should become a new venue for transnational companies to profit from. That's a real question to address. But at the same time, uh, all low and middle income countries will need to make a more strenuous effort mm -hmm. to climb up the ladder of technology to uh, streamline institutional support domestically so that their societies um, generate some uh, endogenous um, let's say, impetus to uh, reduce carbon emissions in their own societies. Well, thanks for your answer, Mr. Jia. Uh, to reach the carbon neutrality, switching to clean sources of the energy also helps to address climate change. And 35 nations have collaborated on an experiment by the International Thermal Nuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER. It is an international nuclear fusion research project aimed at creating energy. For this discussion, we're joined online by uh, Mr. Luo Delong, uh, Director General of China International Nuclear Fusion Energy Program Execution Center. So welcome to our show, uh, Mr. Luo. So how about we start with this section uh, uh, with a brief introduction about ITER. What is ITER and what is the goal of this project? Thank you. ITER is International Thermal Nuclear Experimental Reactor. It's a mega science engineering project trying to produce uh, power or generation uh, power, uh, use the same uh, kind of theory as uh, the sun. So currently it's uh, composed of seven members, in, uh, namely China, Europe, India, Japan, Korea, R Russia, and the United States. Altogether, we have seven members, but uh, Europe itself, uh, we have 28 mem members, so there are around 34 countries all together in this uh, project. We are trying to produce uh, a thermonuclear uh, fusion reactor uh, to, to explore the possibility to use uh, fusion to generate uh, power, which is uh, similar to how the sun is making power. You notice that uh, in China and in many other countries that we they they, they also have their uh, fusion facilities. But why does ITER need global scientific support, or how important is this global cooperation to this project? You know, uh, to produce uh, uh, some to produce something uh, like the sun on the Earth is really a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, it's very very difficult. We need uh, very complex uh, facilities to trying to achieve this. So to do this, 
we need to, to share the knowledge of the world. We need to share the cost of the big, very expensive project, and we need to share the risk. Because uh, it's a difficult project, we don't really uh, know the fi fi final goal is achieved. Of course, uh, we have confidence, but, uh, but still we need to share the, the risk. So all this is really uh, the need for international collaboration. And uh, for this project, all the members are bearing the same objective and uh, trying to address the common goal, which is to address the international issues uh, to solve the uh, energy need. I mean, to, to meet the energy needs need of the humankind. So by this, we come together and to, to try to make this project. So what does this either in nuclear fusion technology mean for the future of the mankind? Does that mean we can get rid of the fossil fuels completely? Uh, yes, but uh, not uh, very soon, because mm -hmm. uh, it's really very difficult. So mm -hmm. far, we're still at the stage of experiments. And uh, uh, by the time we will trying to address all the science, scientific issues, tech technology issues, but still we need time to make commercial use of it. And uh, if we can succeed, uh, really we can uh, solve all the needs of uh, energy of the humankind in the, long, in the long run. Currently we are believing in the middle of this century, we can make it. Thank you so much, Mr. Lo, for, your, for all of your introduction about ITER. This is a really cool job. So another focus of uh, international collaboration is uh, biodiversity. That's something I really want to address today, biodiversity conservation. And uh, I'm very glad to see that uh, some sort of agreement was reached uh, at COP15 last year mm -hmm. uh, to protect 30% of the planet in general, and also put 30% of degraded ecosystems into protection as well. This uh, by the year 2030. So David, it might be more difficult uh, working to uh, achieve biodiversity conversation balance uh, than working in the ether to get energy from the sun or, or the moon. Yeah, the, you have a couple of different factors at play. You have an environment, and you have a thing called the ecology, and the ecology is the interaction of organisms within an environment. You need a healthy ecology to protect the environment, and you need a healthy environment to protect the ecology. Mm -hmm. One of the critical elements of ecology is biodiversity. Um, people tend to think of scientists as noble, dispassionate mm -hmm. people, disinterested people, who are above human interests, and really that's not true. Scientists are human beings like the rest of us and they're just as subject to fads and fashions. Mm. A huge amount of attention is currently being given to global warming, mm. to climate change. But within the biodiversity issue, there's one specific problem and it's insect die-off. There has been a massive decline in insect populations and it's already happening. Insects are critical to biodiversity, they're critical to the existence of vegetation, they are critical to the food chain, because they're right at the bottom of the food chain. And it's not getting enough attention. Now, it's something that needs to be addressed as part of the global community of shared future, because it's worldwide. Mm. It's affecting developed countries, it's affecting virgin jungle. Mm. Now, why am I talking about that in this specific forum? Because China needs to take the lead. Mm. China creates more scientists mm. in relative terms than anywhere else in the world. And given the scale, that means in absolute terms, mm. China is creating a far greater number of science scientists. Chinese culture is a more rational culture mm. than Western culture. So I would hope that this is a particular problem that China will pick up on and China will address because frankly if this problem which is already here is not addressed we can actually stop worrying about how hot it's going to be in 2050 because there isn't going to be anybody left to be hot. So from a biodiversity point of view, from a global community 
point of view, there are important things that can only be addressed globally and must be addressed as a matter of priority. Right. And Mando, uh, what's your point on uh, biodiversity conservation, especially in a continent of uh, Africa? Uh, what uh, more efforts and help do you think Africa needs in terms of that? Um, okay, I totally agree with um, the last guest because um, biodiversity is essential for um, we know the processes that support all life on Earth, including us, human. And uh, uh, they are actually uh, also, we have to mention, it, it is uh, true for Africa or for any, anywhere else. There are some um, areas that are actually neglected, as I, I totally agree with the last guest. We have, for example, pollinators, like such as bird or bees, or the last um, uh, guest mentioned the insects that are actually estimated to be uh, responsible for a third of the world's crop production. So without those actually pollinators, we, we would not, for example, have um, apples or cherries or blueberries and any and many things, many other things to, 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 to uh, we eat. So uh, human, we depend on uh, the services ecosystem provide like fresh water, uh, soil uh, fertility and stability and food and medicine. If I'm uh, referring to Africa, for example, uh, I would take the, the case of uh, Kenya's Lake uh, Turkana. It is uh, one of the world, if not the world's largest desert lake. And um, uh, it, it has a habitat for, it is a habitat for a variety of uh, wildlife, including birds, night crocodile and hippopotamus. And uh, it is a source of food and income for about 300,000 people. But the lake is under heavy pressure because of overfishing, because of uh, the drought and also um, changing uh, rainfall patterns and the uh, diversion of water by the upstream development. And these changes are leading to a loss of biodiversity and the decline of a fishery, etc. So without conservation method in place, this could be um, the fate of many more ecosystems. So I totally agree that um, the, uh, if we can have uh, such points uh, to the attention of the international community, it will be uh, very interesting, especially considering the fact that the African continent is very special in the fact that it produces less than 4% of the CO2 emission. We talked about uh, CO2 uh, gas emission like last time. So we are facing a kind of a climate uh, injustice uh, in Africa. So if uh, it could uh, be brought to the attention of the international community and uh, Africans as African leaders uh, kept uh, putting uh, to the table, if African can also have more seats uh, when it comes to the UN uh, Security Council uh, or relevant uh, platform, that will be uh, helpful. But um, overall, uh, it's still uh, uh, is still a task, a task that can be completed uh, together, like hand in hand, it is uh, becoming a global uh, issue. Well, I, I think we all understand the significance of protecting biodiversity mm. as well as with, uh, protecting our climate and environment. Mm. Everybody knows it's that. It's a universal idea. The problem is the solution. Right, and, and we've been covering the COP15, we're covering COP27, um, no matter if it's for biodiversity or climate change, we understand that the biggest challenge is about solution. And people have been fighting for this. Well, I think the biggest challenge and obstacle is still about sharing. They mm -hmm. need to share about funding. They need to share about this technology. They, uh, the developing country is asking the developed countries to transfer their technology, to transfer this fund. And also, um, on the COP15, we, we, we realized that this COP15 requires all of the party to mm. share uh, the, like something, uh, the information, like the digital information about genetic information, and they want to share this because some of the certain genetic code of some certain plants can produce billions of dollars mm. each year for the pharmaceutical companies. Mm. And those information are coming from the developing countries, but the profits stay in the developed countries and those big companies. And that's the big issue. So Mr. Lou Beltran, uh, I want to hear about your takes on that. Uh, yes, I think the, uh, the awareness is already there, uh, you know, from the upper class to the uh, bottom line, but uh, skills are not really there to match what is really required for uh, the ecological protection. So therefore, uh, to really to uh, build the right type, type of uh, uh, training system, uh, 
and uh, so that a technology can be dis uh, dispersed and skills can be enhanced to address the uh, local and also critical issues uh, that are there uh, to challenge the environment is something that is highly realistic and also cost effective. And the other is that uh, there needs to be a very uh, fine balance uh, in terms of expectation to address such climate change because people do need to uh, balance their economic growth versus uh, the environmental quality. You can't you know, ask people to starve uh, for, uh, for months before they can really you know, have a good environment. So therefore, uh, so that's something that, uh, uh, that needs to be a more rule-based and consensus-based uh, you know, uh, operational program. So the common but differentiated responsibility needs to be further delivered in terms of the uh, shared responsibility versus uh, the climate change. And then uh, also that uh, you know, the world need to, uh, to work together to uh, really to restructure the uh, economic uh, pattern uh, in which the China is, is really playing a uh, pivotal role so the world uh, begin to blame China as the uh, biggest uh, the uh, carbon emitter, but uh, China is operating the world factories. No, uh, you know, Americans are really uh, they're willing to make shoes, you know, do, uh, doing those garments and making even making TVs. Or Europeans are the same. Actually, we export more than 90 percent of our solar panels to Europe to North America. So therefore, you know. When China is really supporting a, uh, a more a cleaner environment and a higher level of lifestyle, and so China needs to be sympathized and uh, also supported uh, in its uh, uh, entire program towards the carbon neutralization and carbon peaking program instead of finger pointing on China. A companies needs to really to enhance the corporate social responsibility program so that uh, they are not there to uh, uh, forsake mm. the uh, ecological benefit in order to uh, achieve more of the stockholders uh, uh, you know individual interest mm. and on the other hand we also need another CSR which is the uh, you know the uh, social uh, citizenship mm. uh, responsibility in which that uh, everyone will be there to be respected and also you know uh, pay the right responsibility uh, in terms of consumerism and also in terms of their uh, you know, the uh, care mm -hmm. about the earth mm -hmm. uh, in uh, individual life and also in their communal, uh, communal life. Right. We, we, we've actually seen some sharing, like sharing information, like the vaccine distribution, like a COVAX in, in the pandemic. COVID-19 actually is a common crisis, maybe less than the helium and flash, but more or less the same. So in terms of dealing the pandemic, Aina, how would you reflect the global effort on that? I give about a D minus. I mean, D minus. Yes. I mean, uh, China was castigated for doing probably what, you know, in six months from now, you're going to be able to look at excess deaths over a three and a half year period. And you're going to be look at the, the economies and you're going to see something very simple. China did very well. Uh, another existential threat for uh, countries that didn't do well, whose leadership was uh, basically out to lunch, more interested in populism than actually the welfare of their, of their uh, constituents. Uh, so right now we have this situation where hundreds of billion, you know, over $100 billion was found to prosecute a war, a conflict in mm -hmm. Ukraine. Uh, yet $50 billion oh, was out of reach. It, you know, that would have been a game changer if you had inoculated everybody at the very beginning. Trillions of dollars in lost economic activity would have been saved. Millions of lives would have been saved. Yet, you know, I, I don't agree that we're rational. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, it is irrational. We, we, we had the rational option. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Mm -hmm. You saw people playing politics. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things. One. Shared values does not mean, all right, as far as I understand, homogenized values. Mm. China is not trying to get the rest of the world to adopt Confucianism. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be made very clear. What they're saying is that we have basic values, human values, that we should share and cherish. And we should work on that basis. In terms of conflict, there's always going to be conflict. You know, the last 5,000 years of recorded history have shown us that human beings haven't changed. Mm. The enemy 
is the person we see in the mirror. It's our better natures versus our worst natures. When you talk about greed, I automatically thought of Exxon. In the 1970s, they knew global warming was there. They had confirmed it. All their scientists were saying it. Well, not all. I'm sure there's one who's willing <laughs> to say no. But they, they, you know, they buried the reports and went forward. Why? Because it was good for them. You know, one of the elephants in the room we haven't discussed is population. Population is expected to increase by 50%, over 12 billion before, quote, it tapers off, quote, naturally. I, I don't understand how that's going to happen naturally. I mean, right now, we are having tremendous problems with everything that you have been thinking. And what is the root cause? Overpressure due to population explosion. Why do I talk about it in terms of greed? Because of the classical idea, economically, that rising populations lead to bigger business, more profits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's killing us and our inability to do that. I'm not saying that we should, we will act rationally, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that shared values to me is about our better nature trying to put our worse nature in check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Joseph? Well, I totally agree. And um, the last, I mean, it totally resonates uh, with Africa as well. When we talk about uh, vaccine distribution, mm -hmm. uh, you will see that there, there are a lot of, I would say, uh, you, know, uh, this, you know, asymmetries because um, Africans, Africa as a whole, or African countries as a whole, haven't yet received actually a greater percentage of uh, a vaccine. When I'm talking, when I say Africa, I say, you know, African people. And uh, for me, uh, I still um, keep a lot of expectations because um, if we are to rate now what is happening now, I think uh, it is still a lot questionable, especially when it, when it comes to uh, the fact that we haven't yet learned you know, from our past, from whatever uh, happened in the past. And I refer to, for example, if we take the Africa, uh, the Africa case, you know, the Ebola crisis, the HIV uh, case, you know, and uh, the yellow fever, you know, all those we've been through all those, um, uh, we've been to all those, uh, I would say, uh, 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 crises. And when it comes to the Africa, we also had problems with uh, vaccine distribution. And now here we go again with a new crisis, COVID-19. And uh, so I still, um, I go with the last um, uh, guest, you know, sharing, uh, but less also, you know, because everything is already profitable. So, you know, human centered, that's why uh, Africa, in many African countries resonates with also with uh, China, a uh, people centers philosophy uh, when it comes to, you know, these uh, um, uh, health issues. Yeah, so basically uh, that's it. But I still, I wish that we can, uh, you know, really learn from, we can ha have a solidified, I would say not even method, or we can have a solidified mindset w within this COVID uh, crisis to prepare uh, further or later on crisis, because this unfortunately won't be uh, the last crisis. Well, thanks, Joseph. Um, I think after pandemic, restoring our economy would be the mission number one. But unfortunately, this is not an easy job because we have to solve this untamable inflation around the world. Major economies are handling the inflation in different ways, which also have global impacts. So, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, there's any, any way to curb the inflation? <laughs> any solutions to that? Well, uh, inflation was uh, really caused by the overdosage uh, in uh, the uh, dealing with uh, uh, the pandemic. So that's one of the reason. And uh, because simply you print more money and uh, flood the market and uh, the goods are there not really matched. So this round of infl inflation is really uh, caused from the supply side in which uh, uh, much of the physical and the political obstruction mm -hmm. over the free movement of goods in uh, logistic management and also in the uh, you know uh, uh, huge ter uh, tariff that is being imposed uh, that make things are really difficult in, in the end the consumers are there to pay the price so uh, right now uh, simply by tightening the interest rate uh, you know can uh, really uh, you know uh, bring the inflation down as what, uh, what is being handled in the United States and uh, in the uh, European countries. But in the meantime, you're gonna stifle 
the vitality of the economy in which uh, you know people are uh, not there willing to invest and to borrow more money, and consumers are really tightening their purse and not to spend. So you know the the real solution lies in one, of course, you know uh, still global co uh, cooperation instead of uh, you know begging the neighbor. Uh, particularly now, the United States needs to take the right type of responsibility because not only uh, you know the SWIFT system, but also the dominance of the U.S. dollar. So when they really add water uh, into their money, the whole value of the other currencies can be diluted, and then you know uh, you know the uh, uh, G20 uh, needs a better co uh, coordination, particularly in terms of financial policy, and also uh, how we can really streamline. Uh, those uh, you know uh, barriers uh, uh, in terms of the supply of food, energy, and the daily utilities uh, on a more cost-effective way, and uh, eliminate those you know the uh, political uh, uh, rhetorics that are there to uh, uh, to really deprive people of their uh, basic assets. So that's something that needs to, to be quickly done, and that's the uh, more of the uh, strategic solution than a quick fix way, uh, simply by raising interest rates. Professor Xia, but should we see more international, global collaboration in terms of curbing inflation? We're not yeah. seeing quite much right now. Yes, of course. And just now we've uh, talked about a lot of uh, global crises and uh, different crises. Actually, we can have uh, uh, a basic uh, uh, categorization of all these kind of crises. When we talk about crisis, it means that something goes wrong or something is wrong, right? So basically, I have a three dimension to you know help us to understand uh, where does this crisis come from. Mm -hmm. So first uh, is the fundamental or foundation basis. And the second is the leadership or organization or institution or regulation. And the third one is the governance or issue or agenda or basic policy. So we can say that uh, if we uh, can get clear about the why, uh, I mean, I mean, what kind, what kind of a crisis is or what kind of uh, you know uh, problem is, we can you know have a very particular solution. For example, the economic recovery or recovery of the global economy. In my opinion, it does not necessarily mean the international economic order is wrong. Actually, it is about the, the people's governance or the, some kind of the politician or statesman's kind of the personal choice goes wrong or went wrong, mm -hmm. causes this kind of uh, difficulty of recovery of a global economy. And that means, well, someone, you know, um, I mean, intentionally raise some kind of a barrier among people or among communities or among cultures. So next uh, you know, stage, if we want to recover or make the recovery of global economy together or sooner, we need to you know, well, do some kind of a joint effort to reconnect people, to reconnect all these kind of lines mm -hmm. and make this world become more and more open and more and more connected with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. But before that, we still have a lot of challenges to deal with. Uh, we're also witness to global challenges that threaten Put security in the Black Sea last year. Mm. Uh, UN Secretary General Antonis uh, Guterres commented on the crisis, saying, "Quote: Ending hunger is within our reach. There is enough food in our world now for everyone if we act together." Mm. So, gentlemen, if we have this capability to produce enough food, why we are still seeing so many people are suffering from hunger? Uh, maybe we can start from. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean. Look, there's a lot of things. First off, you had a major disruption. Uh, when Russia and Ukraine uh, went into conflict, uh, that just completely threw open, uh, you know, changes in the way that food, first off, availability. Second, the uh, rerouting food to the extent it could be. The last part is fertilizers. And, and this is something people, there's going to be a delayed reaction. In Europe, it is expected, regardless of climate change and heating up and things like that, that you're going to have between 5 and 15 percent less yield because they didn't get the fertilizer they need. And those, those are other issues. So this coming year, it's going to be tough because they, they just didn't get it. So yes, we can produce enough food, but getting it to the people is another thing. I mean, in India, they produce tons of food. Mm. And guess what? A huge percentage of it rots because they cannot get the food to the market. Mm. That's right. All right. They don't have the infrastructure. China has, has said repeatedly, well, to get rich, to do well, build a road. And, and this is true. It's a very basic idea. It's not something that should be controversial. It is not about creating debt diplomacy. It is simply about allowing people, all right, to have a fairly decent life. Mm. And but unfortunately, 
politics one over and over again greed special interests i mean they're not going to allow this and if you talk to them i know some of these people these captains of industries i said you know come on really yeah. is this what your things gmo is is you can make billions of dollars off the backs of people who can barely feed themselves you don't allow them they have to buy the seed from you you control them isn't this a security risk for them mm -hmm. isn't there a, a possibility of disease breaking out and doing that well you know that's just you know look we can't change the industry mm -hmm. our competitors are out there if we don't do it they will this mm -hmm. attitude is what really hurts yeah. humanity. So I just so, so keep nodding his head when listening to uh, Aynan Zhang. So, so what's your yeah, thought on this matter? Definitely, I totally agree, uh, especially, you know, I can relay that from the, um, uh, you know, African continent because uh, conflict is actually uh, keep remaining or, or remains the, the, the number one key driver of acute food insecurity. But we can produce a lot. You know, uh, we all know that in Africa, you know, conditions, all the conditions are, you know, made to produce actually uh, food for, we are now uh, 1.3 billion, you know. So security, um, if we look at the numbers, we'll see that uh, more than 70% of uh, people uh, experiencing hunger live in areas afflicted by war and violence. And then we also have the economic shock, right? Um, we had a total of, for example, uh, 30, 30 30.2 million people in, you know, in uh, various African countries, which uh, actually were in crisis and worse level of acute food poverty were actually noted from 2021 to 2022. And, you know, reflecting actually uh, food prices, soaring for, uh, food prices due to global, global economic recovery from COVID-19, we have to say that, and high inflation that uh, was mentioned a while ago. But also, uh, I, th I think another fact is uh, linked to uh, climate change. Uh, you know, it causes also global hunger, you know, uh, you know, and more frequent and intense extreme weather events. We have over 80% of the world's uh, hungry people who, uh, who live in uh, disaster prone countries. And you might have heard uh, what happened to uh, the East African, you know, historical drought. So it's all, this is, these are also some of the key factors uh, which might explain uh, which might explain why uh, we can produce food yes but still we're facing a food crisis you know we we see from last year african union you know big theme like uh, food security you know uh, was the big theme of uh, the african union so it's those are you know it speaks a lot it's actually trying to uh, raise uh, to to raise awareness so yeah, I think uh, when it comes to the African case, and I think for the whole world in general, those are, I think, in my sense, the main factors why we're still producing, uh, we're producing a lot of food, but still uh, mm -hmm. facing some uh, food insecurities. David, what's your thought on this? And it comes down to the fact that we've looked at a lot of different aspects today. The global political environment has impact and has impacts on things that look small, like fertilizers. Fertilizers doesn't look like a huge thing. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you realize that the actions that we take have international repercussions again. The ripples spread out from what is apparently a small thing and affects the whole world. And we've talked about a number of different aspects today. We've looked at health. We've looked at environment. We've looked at energy use and everything that we look at it becomes more and more apparent that we face challenges that can only be addressed on a global level so just to tie that back to the the theme of this forum this conversation the global community of shared future it becomes obvious the more in detail you drill down you more the more you see that things have an international impact and we must, we must learn to work together. We must learn to build a global community out of disparate, disparate countries with disparate values and disparate systems. And, and Professor Leo. Uh, yeah, I think there are uh, three key words, three A's. One is availability, second is accessibility, third is affordability. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, availability is not really a big issue because we really have abundant supply of food. But uh, accessibility is now being disrupted uh, uh, because of the original conflict and also because of the high rise of the shipping cost, etc. And then also the many of those countries who really suffer from hunger, uh, they are also suffering from uh, debt uh, distress. So uh, how the world really can really help them, uh, you know, first to deal with the contingency uh, issue, and then also to help them to really aid on two very important issues. One is really there to develop the right type of infra infrastructure, uh, because, uh, you know, as uh, my student from Kenya says, you know, during the dry season, uh, you know, he would really uh, you know, tuck uh, be, uh, uh, below the belly of the cow to, uh, to avoid the grace of the sun. And during the, uh, 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 wind, uh, uh, during the rainy season, they would go to the mountains. So they do not really there to build the right type of reservoir to really to, uh, to regulate uh, the, uh, or compensate the seasonal changes. So the infrastructure needs to be uh, there to be uh, supported and developed. And the other is that uh, uh, the, how locally they can really grow. Uh, they are more of their own crops and by storage, by processing, by preserving those food. And then, so this is something that uh, uh, you know, uh, they also need uh, certain help. And the other is that uh, you know, when we talk about the uh, China aiding pr program, the global aiding program, we talk about, well, give them fish or give them fishing. But uh, in addition, giving them fishing skills, and we need also to offer them the fish, uh, the fish market. Mm -hmm. So therefore, China has really, uh, uh, over the past uh, the seven years, actually, we offer zero tariff uh, for all the uh, uh, materials, all the uh, you know, fruits that are made by those least developed countries to be imported into China. And this is really an over-delivery to our commitment to WTO, and China is doing that. And so China is really setting a good example for more of those developed world to really to match uh, the China's efforts. So, you know, with all these, you know, three A's, you know, there should be a, a sort of solution uh, mm -hmm. in which, you know, uh, instead of, you know, giving them, you know, far-fetched ideas, liberal democracy, uh, you know, the, uh, all the big documents or the, you know, Vision 2063, so that's too far. Give them something that's very real. And when we talked about a food crisis, mm. we actually not only talked about it's agriculture and food production, we were talking about so much more than that mm. behind, right? So, Mr. Xiang. Yeah, I totally agree with the previous gentleman's idea. And besides, like I mentioned before, the food security particularly uh, means that the crisis of the food does not necessarily mean we don't have, uh, as a human being, we don't have the ability. We have the ability, right? So it is not about uh, the kind of fundamental. It is about the institution. So there are too much kind of concentration about the production, but too much fragmentation about this kind of distribution. So in my opinion, empower the UN, empower this kind of a global governing system mm. so that everyone can share this kind of uh, food and whatever. Um, uh, I mean, uh, interest. But before we go, uh, I want, I'd like to take uh, a little time from you, gentlemen, uh, to answer my, one of my own questions, the long-lasting questions. We've talked about a lot of issues have been addressed. People are fully aware what dangers and threats we are facing as human beings on this planet, our home sweet home. But we rarely see some real actions or even action plans. So we've seen withdrawal even from the already signed pact or already signed agreement. Why is that happening? Why no actions? Professor Liu. I, uh, you know, I, that is uh, the importance of uh, uh, China's the uh, notion of shared future. Uh, so that can be further di disseminated, understood, and also being uh, strategized for uh, operational uh, no purposes. So the uh, second is the uh, United Nations organizations, as my friend has been talking about, they need to play a more responsible role, I shouldn't say a sufficient role, a more responsible role to really to, uh, to defend the justice, to defend uh, adequacy in the provision of the people's basic need because 
as we said, that um, many of those materials, energy, food, they are there. So we just need to streamline the right type of rules to uh, the, uh, reduce the artificial barriers that block those access, uh, accessibility. And then uh, also that uh, you know, people need to be uh, uh, further educated in order to enhance the right type of capacity. So uh, when I was really making a lecture in the uh, African continent, I said, okay, do not just sit under the tree and wait for the papaya to, to, to drop, but uh, you know, uh, simply you know, uh, get rid of those victim mentality and you know, roll up your slaves and work. And then also uh, the uh, infrastructure development is something that connect people, connect more of the factors of production. And uh, so China is really setting a good example and people are really to benefit. So therefore the best practices can also be dispersed around the world. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the Western world need really to look at a, a basic reality the world order is really on a rapid change, mm. and the comfort uh, by imposing stereotype onto other nations will be uh, the already past history. So mm. therefore, respect the, self de uh, uh, respect the self determination, mm. and also res uh, respect the individual cultural traits by working together, so we are able to find more solutions than problems the humans are really facing. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for your brilliant ideas and opinions, both online and in the studio. We gained a thorough and precise understanding of uh, the concept of building community with a shared future for mankind today. Well, despite mm -hmm. this is uh, a Chinese concept, there is hope that it could be adopted by all civilizations across the world, and because inclusiveness indicates mm -hmm. peace and development, for each and every one of us. Indeed, and as uh, globalization brings nations together closer than ever, and with multiple global crises emerging that impacts us all, different countries should be more open-minded to listen to others' appeals, and the human race needs to decide, and more importantly, act as a community. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to reach too far into the vast universe just yet, but I believe the universal idea of a turning our planet into a peaceful and united place is definitely reachable. Mm -hmm. And uh, a reminder, SGTM will present two other forums on how to safeguard world security and how to promote shared development. Mm. I'm Yang Zhao in Beijing, and thanks for watching. And I'm Li Zhongning. Please stay tuned with CGTN. Bye for now.